Jesus okay. Christ. Alright. Yeah, well, all right. Finish that was almost a tombstone. <laughs> Started wrestling is a source of extravagant entertainment, um, and Kendo feels really that it's nothing more than make believe. I think there should always be some sort of wrestling somewhere because it's just an art form people love. Um, it doesn't matter, it's one of those things that always, it, it never goes away, it's always here. British wrestling has got very Americanized. That's not necessarily a bad thing, but it is nice to have um, the identity of, of British wrestling being that old British style. I think it probably needed that downtime to be able to come back again, um, and obviously WWE very much filled in filled in the gap that was there. It's time for us to say goodbye for the moment from Wembley Arena. Have a good week. Till next week. Wrestling, a sport, an entertainment industry, and a piece of British identity lost to the ages. My name is Adam Brabin, a wrestling fan who is delving into the history of the sport to find out if there really was life before the WWE. As iconic as the modern American wrestlers are to my generation, before them were the British trailblazers who entertained millions in town halls, northern music clubs, and appeared through the television into homes all around the country before disappearing from our screens forever. Bolton's Town Hall used to be one of the greatest venues around in the Northwest area to come and see the wrestlers performing in the shows. Sadly, that's all gone now. Since the decline in the popularity of the sport, the venue now goes unused. As do many of the grand old venues, which once acted as a home for the British wrestling phenomenon, a part of our heritage now as long and forgotten as the buildings themselves. The referee inside the ring, the referee inside the ring, Fred Green from London, and Dave Reese from Shrewsbury, the referee outside the ring, watching the boys. Well, that's slow, Haystack's down a bit anyway, it looks as though he's getting an advantage just now. Another forearm smash over the top of the, the body check. And comes Danny again. I won't see many wrestling holes in this one. Nice. Anyone who remembers British wrestling's golden age remembers World of Sports, ITV's platform to broadcast wrestling to the nation. Many of the wrestlers featured became household names in the UK, and two such men were the bitter rivals, Big Daddy and Giant Haystacks. The final showdown match. Big Daddy on the left, of course. <laughs> Big Daddy in particular struck a chord with the British public. An overweight, middle-aged, working-class fighter who belly bumped his way to success appealed to what can be seen as essentially British values of sporting an underdog and appreciating the pantomime element of entertainment. The British style of wrestling overall, however, was always considered technically skilled, relying on grapples and holds rather than pure athleticism and muscle power, which are staples of American wrestling. The likes of Big Daddy and Giant Haystacks were viewed by some as freak show spectacles, catering to a lowbrow working class audience, and in the end, World of Sport was cancelled. Despite a few failed attempts to revive televised British wrestling, it has remained absent from our screens ever since. The real birthplace of professional wrestling was of course the circus. The great showman of the 19th century, P.T. Barnum, would invite members of the public to enter his big top and win sums of money if they could so much as throw his star attraction, the gigantic wrestler standing in the ring. Of course, Barnum would never have to pay, and from circus tents to music halls, and ultimately to televised bouts at Wembley Arena, the British public would go on to take wrestling to their hearts in a way that no other form of entertainment could satisfy. No falls, no submissions, no wrongs. Finally, by mutual agreement, the final showdown match. Unlimited time between these two. 
Haystacks having avoided Big Daddy for so long. During the heyday of British wrestling, one of the most iconic and notorious characters was a mysterious masked wrestler called Kendo Nagasaki. At one time, he was the most famous name in the business, and the secrecy surrounding the man underneath the mask kept the nation hooked, and viewers tuned in by the millions to see him fight every week. Kendo Nagasaki, the legendary samurai warrior from the golden days of British wrestling. His fame was enormous, and amongst fans attending his matches were often prominent public figures like Prince Philip and the Duke of Kent. In 1976, he appeared on the front cover of the TV Times, and his most famous televised event, an unmasking ceremony, drew in more viewers than the FA Cup final, which immediately followed the programme. Just who was this man? Rumours amongst the British public named him as anyone ranging from famous pop stars to members of the royal family themselves. I was intrigued, and so began efforts to meet the man himself. I've come to Stoke to interview him and see what his thoughts are about the current wrestling climate and his memories of the World of Sport era and his matches against some of the most famous wrestlers that the world has ever seen. The former wrestler now invites people to his home in order to experience the healing powers and philosophy which made a part of his mysterious persona in the ring. The wrestler is famously mute, never speaking a word, and I met with his spokesperson and other team members who assist Kendo, who then escorted me around the grounds of his house. Kendo Nagasaki at the moment is deeply in meditation in preparation for the match, and uh, as I said earlier, I will speak uh, as a voice for Kendo Nagasaki. Hello, my name is Ros MacDonald, and I'm privileged to be the spokesperson for Kendo Nagasaki. The retreat focuses around Buddhist philosophy, and the house was filled with spiritual artefacts, as well as gifts from fans of the masked man who remembered his glory days. I was kept company by his team whilst Kendo meditated in his private space. After an hour or so, it was finally time to meet the man himself. So why does Kendo believe that British wrestling peaked during the World of Sport era? Kendo believes that it was very much something of its time. During those years, there was an abundance of wrestling on television, involving many brilliant wrestlers. Wrestling was, in fact, a very popular spectator sport, uh, both in live venues and on television, and that there were far fewer other types of distractions to um, uh, pastimes such as wrestling available at that time. What is it that Kendo believes appeals to the British fans about British wrestling? Um, if you're asking about British wrestling in particular, it's because it looked far more real than what people see now. British wrestling, particularly in the heyday, in the golden years, was about two men essentially slugging it out, competing solely with each other, with only their skill and experience to help them win. How does Kendo feel about the rising popularity of American-style wrestling, like the WWE? I have to tell you that Kendo is, frankly, completely indifferent to it. Uh, the American style of wrestling is a source of extravagant entertainment um, and Kendo feels really that it's nothing more than make-believe. What is not generally known, one of the great differences between contemporary wrestling and wrestling from the heyday, from the early days, the, the 60s, 70s, 80s of, of British wrestling, is that the level of training was ex extremely high in the old days. For example, Kendo uh, Nagasaki um, is basically expressing himself through this athlete, an incredibly able athlete, who was very, very highly trained. One of the most iconic stars in the whole of British professional wrestling, he is the legendary Kendo Nagasaki. He also became this incredibly skilled and accomplished judoka. But even after that, uh, when he was just about to go to the Olympics to represent the United Kingdom, that's when he lost his finger. And so he couldn't go to the Olympics for that reason. And that's, that's when, if you like, fate intervened and led to the emergence of Kendo Nagasaki. Ken, it's Kendo's view that um, everything is now so Americanized that um, the, the jumping off the ropes and performing acrobatic moves, um, that there's a lot of training for that sort of thing these days. And in, in and of themselves, they are fantastic acrobatic accomplishments, but they're not actually wrestling accomplishments. And so, at the time, no, um, it wasn't appreciated what, we didn't appreciate what we had in the old days. We didn't appreciate just how highly trained, how dedicated and how truly skilled these men were. 
In order to gain a more clear understanding of what exactly goes into becoming a professional wrestler, I thought I should witness some of the training first hand. Max Gym in Oldham acts as a training ground for the future British talent, and they allowed me a glimpse of the work that all the trainee superstars have to go through for a chance on the big stage. Leading the class was Ben Muschiette, a part-time wrestler himself who was passing on his experience to a group of mixed level trainees. I wanted to find out what he had to say about the prospects of these up-and-comers. Could they recreate the success of the likes of Kendo if they put the work in, or are the opportunities simply not there? As you're training these guys, mm -hmm. um, what do you see of the British scene in general? Do you see it doing well compared to how it did in the sort of glory days of you know, Big Daddy and Giant Haystacks? I don't know if it could get back to that level. Some of the guys, the wrestlers, are incredible. Especially even compared to when I started now, 10 years ago. The wrestling has changed dramatically since then. That's so much better. It can gain popularity again, whether it'll be to the uh, level that it was at then, I don't know. Oh! <laughs> You're in the ring with me now, Matty. See, I am the true idol that all of you deserve. Like any combat sport, wrestling is dangerous. No matter how good the performer is, there's always a risk. And that risk is something the training looks to minimise as much as possible. Oh, Jesus Christ! Finish that was almost two stuff. My time in the training gym gave me a good idea how much these guys were risking for their chance to entertain. A chance, it seemed, they were all more than willing to take. Is it sort of like a sacrifice you've got to make the lifestyle of a wrestler? Uh, yeah. Well, depends how much you want to put into it. I mean, I, you know, how much you want to be a wrestler. I mean, I'm in the gym six times a week with uh, like one rest day, and then that rest day is uh, a Saturday. I feel that if you don't want to be on shows and you don't want to do that, and you don't want, really want to do it as a full-time thing, then you shouldn't do it. Look it was actually a show that I was supposed to be on where there were some trainees that weren't quite ready in a rumble. I don't know if it was the first match, but it was on earlier on. I think I went over the top without having done it before. I landed neck first on the apron, and the show slowed down. Uh, it slowed the show down by about 40 minutes while the ambulance came. Yeah, I can you imagine. It down the but the show went on. Yes. It's clear to see the stranglehold that the WWE still has on the developing British scene. The sheer scale of coverage has whitewashed what was once a proud part of the British entertainment industry. And what's the, what's the dream? What's, what's your aim? Uh, well, I mean, obviously everyone's the dream is getting to the WWE, but I really want to travel the world. And who is your favourite wrestler? Of all time? Of all time. Personally, Ric Flair. Because I just think he was incredibly talented. I'd heard of one emerging local club which still tries to emulate the success of those like Kendo Nagasaki and the World of Sport days. New Wave Wrestling Alliance, a promotion which offers a British alternative to the heavily dominated American market. I met with the founder of the promotion, Lauren Saw, to find out why it was so important to her to keep this piece of British history alive. How important is it to set up a show that has British values in wrestling? Uh, for me it was more the angle of the entertainment element of it and the actual showmanship because there's two very big elements to a wrestling show there's the entertainment side and there's the technical wrestling side so for me it was all about the entertainment and that's when the the British side of it came into play because we've got a very traditional Victorian venue British Victorian venue and then it was like okay how do we incorporate some of the old styles here how do we incorporate world of sport you know all the kind of things that people loved in the 70s and 80s which is why we ended up with Marty Jones as, as commissioner we being from Manchester and, and one of the stars of world of sport why is it that you think interest faded in the first place it, a, a lot of things run their course and maybe it just got to the point where it was becoming a bit stale but obviously it was cancelled from the TV when it was still at quite a popular stage however if it was on the decline it it almost seems like they just kind of run out of fresh ideas and then new things come along and the past 30 or 40 years have been very very developmental 
What do you think it would take to raise the profile of the British wrestling again and get it back to how it was in the world of sport era? I think it's very exciting time in British wrestling. It's all really taking off. You know, you've got so many different kind of elements to it, different kinds of wrestlers that bring completely different things. I think it probably needed that downtime to be able to come back again. Um, and obviously WWE very much filled in, filled in the gap that was there, so. After we spoke, Laurie invited me to watch a new wave show. The venue, the historic Victoria Baths in Manchester. Once a sporting club for the area, it had fallen out of use in recent times. Not only is the club encouraging a resurgence in British style, its newfound home is once again being restored to its former glory. I lent a hand setting up in the evening, before the show. The wrestlers all chipped in with the ring set up, and even packed bags of sweets that would be handed out to children in the audience. The community spirit I saw amongst the performers made their love of the art form clear. Having grown up watching WWE wrestling, one face amongst all the wrestlers immediately stood out to me. The American superstar D'Lo Brown, one time tag team partner of perhaps the most famous wrestler of all time, The Rock. Though severely jet lagged, having flown over from the US only earlier that morning, the experienced pro took the time to speak with me about the differences he had experienced between US and UK wrestling. Can you just um, tell us a little bit how it is wrestling in England compared to America? Um... To compare wrestling in England to America, it's it's um it's night and day. It's different fan base, different perspective. Um, where America is based, you know, more it's entertainment. It's more lively. Where England is, it's more sports orientated. You know, the world of sport days. Now England is starting to catch up, being entertainment wise, but there's just different respect for it here than it is in America. And I I, I love performing in front of the, uh, the you know the British fans. I love being over here. It's it's a pretty cool. Uh, Unlike, you know, 15 years ago when I first started coming over here, the amount of British talent that um, that compete on a worldwide level has grown exponentially. Finally, what do you think it would take to get um, English wrestling back on the TV? To get English wrestling back on the TV would take really a grassroots revolution, showing the people at the major networks that, you know, by ticket sales of independent shows and whenever shows come around and you, you have to show them that there's there's money in the fact that wrestling could be on TV again and be be viable. Um, I think there should always be some sort of wrestling somewhere because it's just an art form people love. Um, it doesn't matter. It's one of those things that always, it, it never goes away. It's always here. It's, it's been here since, you know, the 30s, the 40s, the 50s, and it's here today. It's just, it needs back on TV. Performing that night, amongst others, was Lauren's partner and co-founder of the promotion, Danny Hope. He would be fighting Xander Cooper in front of what we were all expecting to be a packed out hall in the old venue. Before his match, I managed to catch up with him and find out a little bit about his experiences on the touring circuit. My, my name is Daniel Woodward. My character name is Delicious Danny Hope. Um, he's a bit of a flamboyant and my character wears bright colours and shiny and glitter and tassels and yeah, so it's a, a bit different from, from me in real life. <laughs> Could you tell me about the first match that you wrestled in? Oh god, it's probably about, about 10 years ago now. Um, in a working men's club. Um, there was probably about 15, 20 people in, so nothing glamorous. Um, I think I was wearing Nike track bottoms as well for my first wrestling gear, so yeah, it seems like a, a million years ago. It was, it was nothing to um, nothing to write home about, just yet. yeah, <laughs> it doesn't even class as a wrestling match, I don't think. Danny explained the way he had seen the attitude towards wrestling shift during his career highlighting the improvement in venues as a sign of better things to come. Yeah, the, the venue-wise, it, it's come on leaps and bounds, and, and I think the quality of wrestling is a hell of a lot better as well. It's still, it's still not at the stage where, where people can make a, a full-time living from it, but, but it's definitely going in the, in the right direction. Like most of the people I'd spoken with during my journey through wrestling's history, Danny had noticed the impact America has had on the sport as well. I think it has, the British wrestling has got very Americanized. 
that's not necessarily a bad thing, but it is nice to have um, the identity of, of British wrestling being um, some of the wrestlers being that old British style. Just as we'd hoped, the crowd rolled in, and the atmosphere in the room was every bit as electric as the stories I'd heard from the world of sport days. People old and young had come to see the show, fans of the golden days reliving a slice of wrestling history, and brand new fans who were getting their very first taste of the sport. The night ended on a high, as crowd favourite Danny took the victory in a tense match, and judging by the reaction from the crowd leaving the hall, the evening had been a big success. Having taken a look at the history of British wrestling, meeting performers from the glory days, as well as witnessing the new generation taking their first steps into the ring, I could see that the landscape had changed. To see British wrestling restored to its former glory at one time seemed like an impossible dream, but the tide is beginning to change. As long as wrestling stays in the hearts of each new generation, then British performers will keep coming through, even if the money and fame has emigrated stateside. If people are sitting up and taking notice, I think it's a very exciting time. Um, you've got British wrestlers going to Japan, you've got British wrestlers going to the US. You can see, watching guys perform, they can compete anywhere in the world now, and that's a tremendous you know, pat on the back, kudos to how Britain has, has taken to the, the world of pro wrestling and, and elevated its, uh, its training and, and elevated its talent. And, you know, most of the talent here can compete anywhere in the world. British wrestling may have been knocked down, but it is far from being out for the count.